What's up? So, on the Instagram today, I mentioned we're going to do a Q&A, some nutrition stuff or whatever your questions are, training, nutrition, diet, performance, I don't care. We're going to answer them. So we got some questions and we picked some of the better ones and we're going to go ahead and dive into those. So I'll introduce these are the guys from Team Working Against Gravity, two of the coaches from that site, two of the owners. I'll let you uh, introduce yourselves and kind of give your background. All right, so I'm uh, Francesco, one of the coaches at uh, Working Against Gravity. Uh, right now I'm a world record holder in the junior bench press in the GPC and hold, I think, most of the records in the WPC and GPC in Canada as a junior in 83 kilo weight class. Uh, I'm Hayden Bow. I'm a co-owner and one of the coaches at Working Against Gravity, and uh, I'm a competitive Olympic weightlifter and powerlifter. Awesome! And uh, these guys do a ton of great work with uh, nutrition. Um, you guys, what, standard approach is a flexible dieting approach or kind of based on what the goals of that athlete's going to need? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, we're going to fire off some questions. Uh, Knope 252 Nope, nop, 252. Being at a police academy, I'm only going to be uh, eating once between four, uh, seven and four. Should I try to squeeze four to five meals during the rest of the day or just eat bigger meals when I can? I mean, ideally, uh, ideally you'd like to get your meals as evenly spaced out as possible, but uh, at the end of the day, if you're not in a situation where that's comfortable and that doesn't fit your lifestyle, ultimately just getting in your macros that you need no to matter what yeah. yeah that's most important so I mean I mean basically you know figure out whatever time you're awake and if you can split that by five to figure out how many hours or you've got available meals, to eat yeah yeah it's yeah. a sweet deal that's so, ideal but all right so how would you time carbs for games day and uh, how many events in the Highland Games with so many events in the Highland Games evenly or none just have BCAs um, they're not one or the other I, I tend to try to do both uh, personally, and you guys can tell me if I'm not doing that correctly, um, but I try to eat basically the entire time I'm on the field. You know, just kind of constantly be eating something, whether I bought, you know, some protein bars or a perfect bar or something like that. It's uh, you know pretty easy to digest. It's going to be pretty nutrient dense, so I'm not having to eat like a big quantity of food because I don't like that full feeling while I'm competing with that big bloat. But with nine events. And it is a long day out in the sun. I mean, you have to stay hydrated and you've, I mean, as soon as you're not hydrated, you've lost. Like as soon as you don't feel thirsty, like, as soon as you're thirsty, you, you'll never catch back up. So just constantly be pounding water and go piss as often as you have to. Um, so I'll, I'll drink, you know, usually a gallon of water or more throughout the day with uh, some BCAs in it. I use Modern since uh, I have those and USB Labs is awesome. Um, and then food wise, I will carry usually a bag I buy at the airport in New Orleans. Um, it's salted cashews and um, they have these like praline, so it's just basically liquid sugar coated on almonds mm -hmm. and eat those throughout the day. Like I'll get a, like a one pound bag, but a quarter of that bag is going to be the sugar coated ones and the rest is going to be just cashews. It's usually super easy on my stomach. I can just grab them by the handful kind of in between events and stuff like that and just kind of keep rolling. Yeah, I think uh, that's the right idea, having nutrient-dense stuff so uh, you're not feeling heavy and weighed down. Most important, uh, I would say, would be carb timing. Okay. So for our our clients, at least, we have a lot of CrossFit clients. They have those day-long competitions yeah, right. and multiple events. Uh, it's a little different structure than yours. Sure. We, we usually recommend about 30-35% of their daily intake of carbs prior to the start of the competition. Like and how then, prior to the start would you say? I would say within a two hour window. Okay. If we're talking simple carbs. Uh, and then if they're going to eat outside of that two hour window you want slower burning carbs, things like oats and sweet potatoes, stuff like that. Right on. Uh, and then just evenly distribute carbs and the rest of your macros throughout the rest of the day. Yeah, and I'll, you know, on game day too, you know, usually, you know, all the guys we end up going to breakfast somewhere since it's on the road, whether that's, you know, an IHOP or a local spot, and, and then I usually will eat something pretty carb heavy, you know, get some oats in me and some stuff like that, or maybe some potatoes mm -hmm. with, a, you know, like a skillet or something like that with some eggs and some, basically just as big a meal as I, as I want to eat and uh, kind of be ready to go for the day, but that's what I do. 
but definitely while you're out on the field, just kind of keep snacking on some good stuff. And, and BCAs are awesome. They're gonna, especially if you've got a two-day competition. Yeah. Something I'd really recommend is, uh, you know, you have a big training day. Maybe try a few different things out. Try different foods, or don't try different foods. Try to stick to what you know, especially so that you don't get that bloated feel or bad digestion issues in the middle of a of a, of a water, whatever your event is. Yeah, that I think that goes a long way. Uh, I mean, don't try anything new on game day. Figure it out in training. That's what training's for. Yeah. So I mean, if you're a guy who eats McDonald's every morning, don't decide to try to do something super healthy on game day because now it's competition. They just fucking go eat McDonald's and go yeah. compete. Yeah, do what you're used to. Um. Here's here's one, ja Jaunty Frost. Have you got any tips? for not getting too weak when trying to lose a good chunk of weight, around 100 pounds. Something people often forget is strength to weight ratio, and when you're losing weight, if, and your strength is going down, is it, uh, is it relative to your weight? Are you, like if you were to do like a St. Clair score, or uh, a Wilkes score, has it gone up? Those are things that you really wanna look for. Like you're going to lose some strength, but compared to your weight, have you gotten stronger? That's super relevant in any sport that has a weight class because yeah. that's how you judge if you're a better or worse lifter by that relative strength. So, uh, in terms of limiting uh, how much strength you're going to lose, that comes down to it how did, long, yeah. how duration of the cut, uh, what kind of training you're doing, um, how low you bring your calories, how quickly you want to lose that weight, what else you're doing, what you're eating, how you're sleeping, your stress. There's so many other factors that come into play, but are you going to lose a lot of strength? It's really dependent on you and the approach that you take. Like we really emphasize to try to keep things the same with your training and dieting very slowly if we don't have to lose a lot of weight. But if we're losing 100 pounds, we're gonna see a big decrease in weight quickly and you're probably not gonna see any decrease in strength until we get to the lower edge. You're probably gonna gain a lot of strength yeah. in that time. I mean, ch chances are if you have 100 pounds to lose, you're really out of shape. Um, and so, man, choose that goal first. Let's like, get healthy and, and sacrifice the strength a bit and, and get to the weight that you wanna be at and your body will remember being strong and it'll be easier to get that back but maintaining the proper nutrition once you're at a weight that you wanna be. Mm -hmm. Instead of you poorly serving two things, instead of you you know, not really losing weight because you're so concerned about your strength goals and you're also not getting any stronger because you're kind of playing with the diet. Pick one and commit to that goal and then work on the other once you've reached it. I mean, I wouldn't get too tied up in trying to do two basically opposite things at the same time. But if you have 100 pounds to lose, you could probably gain some strength and lose some weight at the same time. Yeah. Uh, oh, here's a good one for you. Excluding sugars, are there any difference between carb sources when it comes to performance? Absolutely. Like I wouldn't recommend getting 100 grams of fiber as your carb source <laughs> before a workout. You're probably <laughs> going to have yeah explode, <laughs> leave your workout a few or leave your workout a few times. The gym owner's probably not going to like you. Might get kicked out. Uh, but sugar is <laughs> going to be in everything, and it's a damn good pre-workout carb source. It's going to hit you quickly. Um, you know, if you don't have a lot of time or you're driving to, uh, to the gym from work, you're going to want those sugars. Um, but otherwise, like, if you have the time or the luxury to eat a few hours before, yeah, have a sweet potato. But pre-workout, sugar is probably going to be your best carb source. What would you say, you know, for a sugar for a carb source, like say pre-workout, say in the 15, 20 minute window on the way to the gym, what would you recommend? Um, we, I don't want to say candy because people think uh, that's automatically not healthy, but as a quick carb source, something really quickly, that's going to hit you fast. It's going to, you know, or the other extreme, pop, or I guess it's the same extreme, Pop-Tarts. Yeah, like, right. I know there's a lot of red flag Pop-Tarts, but as pre-workout, they, they have a lot of carbs. There's quick digesting carbs. There's a lot of sugar in there. Like, that's going to fuel you for your workout. If you're looking to stay healthy and you're super anti Pop-Tart and candy, something like a high carb fruit or juice mm. apple um, pineapple pineapple yeah. mango yeah banana stuff like that's good but if your workout's going to be longer than an hour and it's going to go past two hours 
you're probably going to want to mix that in with a slow digesting carb or medium digesting carb just to get you right through. What about like, um, you know, intra-workout? I mean, it kind of goes with the same question. What about like Carbolin or any of the... Vitargo. Yeah, some type of carb uh, supplement you can have in your in your drink that you're yeah. working on or even a Gatorade for that matter since it's, I mean, there's 52 grams of carbs in a 20 ounce Gatorade. Yeah, again, that goes back to what I was saying. Um, if your workout's going to go longer than an hour, you might need it. If you're an endurance athlete or... Uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, not concurrent. Uh, I don't think a lot of endurance yeah. athletes are following the things yeah. I'm into. <laughs> <laughs> or CrossFit athletes where they do a lot yeah. of endurance work and strength work at the same time. That's when you might need it, but then you're sacrificing, if you're counting your macros, you're sacrificing carbs to use that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and especially if you're on a cut, uh, you want to have things that are more voluminous generally. So to stay satiated for as long as possible. Right. And if you're drinking your carbs, that's probably the worst thing you can do. Okay. So for me personally, if I'm cutting, uh, I always want to be eating any macro that I'm taking in. So I would rather have fruit with me or some candy, something, instead of drinking a carb source. But if you have tons of carbs to spare, or you're bulking or anything like that, yeah. Vitargo or some other carb cool. supplements, great. There you go. Matt Bunton, underscore Bunton. <laughs> um, Mean Gene RVA, uh, what changes, if any, do you make to your diet during a deload week period? Uh, for me, I, I, I typically still train during a deload um, and kind of what my goals are and if my deload is in the season because I'm getting ready to peak for a game is a lot different if I'm deloading the off season and I'm really trying to build max strength. Um, during the off season, I'll, you know, I'll track my uh, calories and macros a lot better than I am in season. In season, I really try to stay focused on performance and how I'm currently feeling. And so, I mean, if it's a deload week, I'll train, but I'll drop the weights really low and keep some high volume, just try to get some blood flow, and that way I'm not super sore all deload week, like my body just shuts down. Um, but if I, you know, if I'm gonna do some extra conditioning or stuff like that, I like, I like food, so days that I don't train at all, I get kind of bummed out because I feel bad about eating as much as I want to. Mm -hmm. So I like to just do something on a deload week. Um, but yeah, you definitely cater it to what your activity level is going to be that week. If your deload week is shut it down and lay on the couch, don't eat like you're burning an extra 2,000 calories every day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I find that this really depends on the athlete and where they are in their training. Like what Matt was saying, if he's in season or he's off season, um, if the athlete is in their deload, it might be beneficial to keep them in a surplus or where they're at and not change anything. Uh, really in training, depending on what you do, you're not burning as many calories as you think you are. It's probably around 300, 400 calories within an hour. And if you're in a deload, you're going to burn very close to that or the same because like what Matt does, he increases the volume. Um, so for recovery purposes, I probably wouldn't change anything. And uh, just for consistency, you know, changing macros on a deload week or lowering them because their their activity level has gone down can really kind of screw with people's minds if they're already in a deficit and training is already or that's a good point yeah yeah no yeah I, I think you nailed it i mean another thing you know it's not really your question but man deloads are important be smart if you're really strength training and you've got a deload scheduled i mean i do mine four weeks on and one week off and there's a lot of times where i finish my four weeks and i feel really strong and i want to keep going but I know my body well enough to know that if I do push for say another two weeks, something I'm gonna get way too beat up to recover at all and I'll end up taking a huge step back. Whereas if I do take that deload like it's scheduled in my program, after that week I'm hungry to come back to lifting and I'll kill the next four. Mm -hmm. Instead of gaining two and having to drop off three weeks because I'm hurt. Yeah. So I mean be smart and do your deloads correctly and remember that, you know, active recovery is a huge part too. I mean don't just stove up. And, and do nothing. Just to jump back to what Francesco was saying too, the mental part of uh, cutting on a deload, or cutting your calories. Sometimes you just don't want to mess with that, especially going into a competition. Like you were saying right. earlier, don't uh, don't change anything on competition day. Yeah. Same sort of thing. If you're deloading for a competition, don't change things on competition week. Don't give yourself an excuse or something to to blame things on. Keep everything consistent. Uh, level do you thrive is spam. <laughs> so, uh, do I know any throwers in Springfield, Missouri? You want to start throwing for the Highland Games? I think someone else answers that below. Uh, 
Dan McKim's in Kansas City. Give him a ring. Um, S zero me thing totally cool. S zero me thing totally cool. <laughs> In your opinion, does the consumption of alcohol in moderation, of course, have positive or negative effects on strength training? Um, I can't justify in any logical way that alcohol is good for my training, physically. However, with that said, there is something to be said for the stuff that Chris Duffin does with the whiskey and deadlifts. There is an extra punch it tends to have. I mean, if you're just say drinking a lot every night post training probably not um if you're i mean i drink uh typically after a competition to celebrate and being done with a competition usually not being hurt or if i am hurt i'll probably drink anyway <laughs> um i mean it all depends on what your goals are if your goals are dropping a lot of weight and you know you want to be a bodybuilder and get that lean i'd probably say alcohol is not going to be your best bet um, if you want to be a strict strength athlete and your goal is putting more weight on the bar and you're not concerned about a weight class, I think you can probably have a couple drinks every now and then. So that's uh, my uneducated opinion. And they can give you some smart stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, it goes back to what Matt was saying, it's context. Who you are, where you are, where you want to be. Um, if you're counting your macros, you're going to have to count your alcohol and either carbs or fats. And is alcohol the better nutrient dense thing that's going to fuel you for your next day? Probably not. But is it going to keep you motivated if you can go back home and enjoy that beer with your family or go out with your friends and keep you, or like a social thing, you know, a lot of people go to the gym for social reasons. If you want to go have that beer after and then it's going to lead you to go back the next day, probably not. It's, it's going to be just fine. But if you're an elite athlete training for an event, it's definitely not a good idea to consume alcohol in moderation. Maybe cut it out a few weeks back. And just for those who are counting calories or macros, the uh, technique that we use to uh, keep alcohol in check if you do decide to drink, he touched on it briefly, is you either count it as carbs or as fat. Mm -hmm. And you take the total calories of the drink and you divide it by either four if you're counting it as carbs. Okay. And then you count it as whatever that number is. In Toward carbs, your carbs for the day. Carbs, mm -hmm. Or you would take total calories divided by nine and that number would be how many grams of fat you would count it as. So it kind of still holds you accountable because you right. can just have endless amounts of alcohol and you're still keeping calories in check uh, and limiting the amount that you can ultimately have. Awesome. And, and then remember, put it on paper. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Alcohol <laughs> in the clear form is for rich women on diets. Drink bourbon, kids. <laughs> Fire for effect. Uh, when you put it on paper, like the amount of alcohol you need to drink to get drunk is, if you're in a deficit, really isn't worth it. it, it Yep. Like if you were to have like four shots, probably the same as maybe a Big Mac or something, you know? Yeah. Like which it's one are you really going to choose? Or yeah, yeah. A lot of salad, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> salad. Uh, Mikey Max, 6612. How often would you say you use uh, chiropractic care outside help to keep the body on point? I asked because I just made a career change and started chiropractic school, looking for feedback from strength athletes like yourself. Um, I don't know about these guys. Uh, me personally, uh, in season, I will see my chiropractor a um, couple times a month, maybe even as much as once a week, depending on how beat up I am. I also like soft tissue work from a good massage therapist, uh, ART work, stuff like that. And uh, doing some digging that I can't personally do on my own uh, via foam roller or lacrosse ball or any of those things. Now I'm doing those type of things daily as needed and uh, you know, in a decent warm up, but you know, a specialist to actually address soft tissue issues I have, I definitely try to see somebody as often as needed. And if it's not needed in my season, I'm definitely seeing one every other week. That's, yeah. that's my rule of thumb. Yeah, I would say get as much as you can. Yeah. I mean, I, I max out my coverage in pretty much everything, whether I'm hurt or not, I just go in for tune ups. And mm -hmm. yeah. if you have good coverage, you might as well use it. It's way easier to keep doing the maintenance than it is trying to scramble to fix something because something's hurt. Yeah, absolutely. If I had the luxury, I'd be doing it every day. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know when you, if you're feeling it, if you're feeling some sort of discomfort, if you can't find the actual pain that's causing it, I would see a chiropractor or any sort of professional who can help you out. Yeah, yeah chiropractic 
get some knowledge from PTs. I mean, I mean the other thing is right now we're really lucky. I mean, there's more information available to self-address and self, you know, not just diagnose and be a crazy person with WebMD, yeah. but <laughs> I mean, figure out what your problem is and then there, there's probably 20 options available just on YouTube for you to figure out how to address that issue. Someone has made a video about it. Yeah. And uh, give that a go. And if that's, you know, and if that doesn't work, take a step to the next level. And that next level is either going to be a massage therapist or chiropractor. And if that doesn't work, follow the next level. I mean, it's just kind of a you know, progression of who you go see to get fixed. Yeah. So, but uh, good job. Enjoy chiropractor school. Uh, PR1 Moen. Perm1 Moen. Anyone got an idea of what that he's actually trying to do with that? No. Uh, PR1. <coughs> Primo1. Oh, okay. Fuck yeah. Got it. <laughs> Figured out your, your code, Da Vinci. Uh, if you're sitting around 15% body fat and ultimately wanted to be bigger, stronger, and leaner, all three and never spent a good amount of time uh, in a surplus, would you get leaner first and try to build from there? Or slowly up calories and try to do some gaining while staying lean-ish? Uh, I'll let you guys have that our one. Our approach, depending, well, I mean, it depends on your goals, but generally our approach would be to get you leaner first and then slowly build you back up. Yeah, at around 50% body fat, if you try to stay in a surplus, you're going to add more fat than you need to. More fat than muscle anyways. and. You already said that you're not, you haven't been training very long. You've been staying in a deficit for a while now. Um, I would definitely try to try to do a recomp, uh, eat, try to eat at maintenance and see where that goes for a while. But um, have time in a surplus. Yeah, your goals are a little bit conflicted. You want to get bigger, stronger, and leaner. Than all. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really happen all at once. Uh, no. But yeah, I would definitely try to cut down a little bit, get to maybe around 10, 11% body fat. It's a little bit safer and you're gonna put on a little bit more muscle than fat at that rate. And then when you do wanna cut, you won't have to jeopardize losing that fat or that muscle and lose or having to cut too hard. I don't have any answer for you. I'm uh, not lean and never <laughs> have been. It's never worked out for me. So uh, bigger and stronger has always worked, but I don't understand what 15% body fat even is. <laughs> um, on to the next one. Russell's, Russell's P. Jr. Any tips for treating and preventing wrist pain from lifting? Um, I recently did a video on kind of uh, some wrist mobility stuff. Uh, so check that out in the Meathead Mobility. I'm using either a sledgehammer for some tosses back and forth, pinning it this way and working up and down, just trying to, you know, a lot of times wrist pains either gonna be called by your hands maybe being too tight or even some uh, tightness through the forearm that's gonna be working its way back the other direction. I mean, that, spend some time stretching you know, pin, do that, really work on the forearm. That's what's gonna lock the wrist down and hurt because you can't get back into those positions. Mm -hmm. um, are you using wrist wraps? If you're not, get some good wrist wraps. Uh, that's what I would do to recommend wrist pain. I mean, if you have any other hand pain or issues, I mean, you can use a rice bucket mm -hmm. for some work like that, or even a rubber band do some hand opening exercises. You know, we spend an awful lot of time squeezing this way and none of us really ever bother building any strength in the opening. I and mean, if you look at most of us, we'll stand this way a little curled in. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, take a rubber band, put it around your hands and stretch out and see if that will alleviate some, some of the inflammation you've got in your either hand or wrist. But that's, that's what I would do. If you want to get a little fancier too, Iron Mind has a lot of cool little- uh, Yeah, those little finger toys, gadgets, finger yeah. Ones. You can do them individually, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Oh, and definitely see if you're doing the movement correctly, if your hand positioning's right. Maybe you're going a little too inverted or too wide out and that's causing the pain. Yeah, yeah, it could, yeah it could be caused because of a lack of shoulder mobility. I mean, if it's a catch position in the clean, you may end up having to be in a spot that you shouldn't be in because you're having to go really wide to get it to your chest yeah. instead of being able to get here where you'd want to be. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, try to, you know, address it logically. Figure out, you know, where upstream or where downstream possibly the pain could be coming from. Man, unless you're doing something that's really just smashing your wrist. And if you're doing that, stop. <laughs> uh, figure out a different Don't way. That. So uh, now some questions from the old Facebooks. Joshua Sayu. I don't know how to say your last name. Um, 
I've heard different views on how much protein you should be taking in when it comes to uh, when you are lifting weights, especially when it comes to what your goals are. Is there a really good study about this? And if, if not, what is a really good rule of thumb for a man who wants to improve his deadlift by 100 pounds in a year? <laughs> uh, this question is very vague and it doesn't tell us very much who, but uh, which person specifically. Are you strength training? Are you in the deficit? Are you in a surplus? Like, there's just so many questions to be asked. But um, there's definitely a few good studies out there, and one I'd recommend is by, uh, I believe it's uh, by Eric Helms and uh, Alan Aragon. It's a, uh, uh, I think it's, it's publicly available on JISSN, J Journal, Journal of International Sports Science Nutrition. So if you go over there and just type in their names, it'll probably be up at right the top in uh, their top uh, journals. It's a meta-analysis, so what they did was they took about 30 different studies and they compiled all the research there and they gave, they give you everything you need to know. It kind of gives you an idea of how much protein to how much protein to per pound of body weight yeah. and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, Hayden? I'm trying to find the, uh, the question here on your Facebook. It's on my, my athlete page. Uh, <laughs> If he's got it. I mean, the other half of your question, is there a really good, you know, is there a rule of thumb to, if you want to improve your deadlift by 100 pounds a year? Man, that's a, a crazy question. So to answer that, you're going to actually make me go in and look at you on your page. Where's that? Get weird. It's on his athlete page. Um, let me figure out what it is you look like. Okay. I actually know you. All right. Um, you're a smaller guy. That would be him. Okay, yeah. So he, this is definitely a sub 200 class. He probably weighs in the 150 to 175 range, if I was a guessing man. Uh, probably fresh to training and fresh to real training, if he is. Okay. Um, I think adding 100 pounds to your deadlift in a year is really not a crazy goal as uh, new to training as I think you are. I think a pretty solid rule of thumb for me to give you, I mean, it depends. Are you trying to gain a bunch of weight with that goal of hitting a 100 pound deadlift? There's a lot of things. So let's just say that your goal is a 100 pound deadlift and let's get you there as fast as humanly possible. Addressing that, I would say you need to go between, you know, go for sure a gram of protein per pound of body weight, possibly one and a half. I think two is excessive for any time I've ever used it. Mm -hmm. um, but I would do that. And I would also probably eat a lot. If you're going to be lifting heavy and pulling a lot, which you're going to need to do if you would like to add 100 pounds to your deadlift, you're, you're going to have to eat a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, make sure the protein's getting in there and then, you know, keep your food healthy. Stay out of drive throughs But they probably have some better answers. Uh, yeah, well, looking at your photos, it looks like you're relatively new to lifting maybe a year, year and a half. So then your progression's probably still going to work for you. Uh, maybe try increasing your deadlift frequency maybe twice a week. Uh, I wouldn't say more than that if you're going to go heavy because deadlift is a, a pretty demanding lift. And if you're going to plan to do 100, 100 pounds, like I wouldn't do heavy lifting deadlifts pretty often. Um, so maybe just try adding 5, 10 pounds at every single week and see where that goes. Yeah. I mean, like you said, there's no magic number. Yeah. Uh, but general range would be 0.8 grams per pound of body weight to 1.4, 1.5 grams per pound of body weight. And based on what type of training you're doing, if you're strictly a strength or power athlete, you're gonna to wanna to have more protein. So like you said, about 1.4, 1.5 grams per pound of body weight would be effective for you. I mean, there's, there's gonna be way more concern in what training you're doing and how well you're recovering from it to add 100 pounds to your deadlift than it has anything to do with the amount of protein you're getting in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you could not care about your protein intake and still put 100 pounds on your deadlift if you work really, really hard and just eat a lot. But you are never going to put 100 pounds on your deadlift just eating protein. So the important side of this is going to be the training and how you're doing it. And if your deadlift's the goal, I mean, hit your deadlifts often, do some volume work, go through some regular progression like a normal cycle. Yeah. And uh, Let's get on that barbell. Yeah. Spend a lot of time pulling weights. You know, try different stuff, pull sumo some, pull you know, off a block, pull off of pins, pull from a deficit, pull snatch grip. There's about a million different variations. Do some bands, do some chains. Pull a lot if your goal is to deadlift a lot. That's really the best way about it. Yeah.
and where you are in your training, protein isn't your biggest concern. It's going to be your training. Um, calories in, calories out is also going to play a big role, but protein, as long as you're hitting a minimum of maybe 100 grams, you don't look like the biggest guy 100 grams and just making sure you're getting enough carbs and fats to keep you going. Uh, last question, Marshall Courtney. I'm 6'1", I walk around at 195. Kind of a skinny guy. <laughs> I uh, still hold store fat in the midsection. My diet has cleaned up very much in the last year. I have recently cut to the 85 kilo weight class for a weightlifting comp, but felt weak and irritable by cutting weight so fast. Mm -hmm. Any tips on how to lose the midsection fat but keep my body weight? I hit a wad once a day and come off of a weightlifting cycle and will start another in August after returning from the CrossFit Games as a spectator. Uh, keep up the good work, uh, blah, 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 blah. All right, thanks, man. But, um, oh, nice. Thanks for uh, seeing me at the weightlifting meet. I appreciate it. Sorry I was drunk. <laughs> um, so I'll let these guys handle that because that is out of my realm of knowledge. Okay, so there's a big difference between weight loss and fat loss. And this is where people get confused. They see the scale and it goes down, but most of what they're losing is going to be glycogen and water weight. Uh, so what you really want to concern yourself is with fat loss. And that doesn't always show up on the scale. You lost 10 pounds and you lost it pretty quickly. And like I said, it's mostly water weight. And doing that hardship of cut, I'm sure you cut out all your carbs or went pretty low. So that's probably why you became irritable. You lost a lot of weight quickly, but it wasn't the fat that you were looking for. And that's why you still hold the fat that you have in your midsection. So what I would recommend is holding steady deficit and uh, just keep that going until you get to your goals. Just keep it real simple. You're saying steady deficit. So it's going to be a little bit of trial and error. Just lower your calories, uh, maybe 200 calories, see how that affects you. Uh, see if you start losing weight, see if your body composition starts changing. If it's not changing, you're probably still in maintenance range, so lower your calories again. Try another 200 calories lower uh, per day and continue that until you see some sort of body weight loss, body composition change, and yeah, just do a lot of trial and error. And, and track it, make sure you're tracking it too. Use MyFitnessPal, Macros Plus, whatever you have so you can stay consistent. You know, I think a big mistake people make is, you know, one of, one of the issues is everybody wants now. Mm -hmm. And there, are, there aren't any easy routes. And so, I mean, whether you, it's, it's gonna be weight loss strictly or fat loss or trying to gain strength, all of it is just gonna be consistent work done over a long period of time yeah. is gonna yield the results you want. Yeah. And so, I mean, if you're not too certain on diet stuff and you've been getting a lot of bro science and you've been getting a lot of stuff like that, I really recommend working with guys like this who do know. I'm not a guy who knows a whole terribly lot about diet and I've been strength training hard and competing for 20 years. It's just never been my knowledge source. Uh, I'm trying to learn more about it and that's why I'm hanging out with guys like this. Uh, so, I mean, get a chance, work with these guys, uh, workingagainstgravity.com. And uh, is that where they can find you? Yeah, workingagainstgravity.com. You can email us at uh, info at workingagainstgravity.com. If you want to follow uh, myself, Francesco, or our other partner, D, I'm at workingagainstgravity on Instagram. He's at F underscore Catalano on Instagram, and she's at Adi Zucker. Awesome. So you can check out all those sources, and uh, yeah. Yeah, they've got a lot of uh, a lot of picks, and uh, I've been exchanging a lot of information with them. They've worked with my wife. It's been really great, really great program. Uh, check them out. Uh, I think you guys are pretty affordable, as yeah. well. You yeah. know, compared to some other online coaching I've uh, I've yeah. heard about. So, check these guys out. Tell them Matt Vincent sent you, and uh, get better, get stronger, and uh, keep kicking ass. You guys, anything? No, thanks for watching and uh, check us out. I right. have to work with all you guys soon. Cheers.